mentioned, um, I'm a little bit nervous coming here and standing in this position, whereas normally I'm down there. So um, bear with me. Um, I just thought I'd like to begin by talking about last night. The last thing I saw, and many of you may have seen also on Late Line on television, um, was the um, incredible tragic image of the um, oil spill in the Gulf and the collecting of all those birds completely black and dead and, and brown, covered in oil and, you know, this massive incredible disaster. And um, Obama saying, well, it's time that we do reconcile um, our, but, you know, our dependency on fossil fuels and what we're doing to the environment. And the, the talks have been going on today. And of course, we, we wonder, will, it, will anything change? But um, I, for a long time, as an artist, have really been interested in art finding a voice, a political, uh, environmental voice and it's for a long time I've been trying to do that in my work and I wonder if you'd mind if I just read to you a little um, a piece I found from a book I absolutely love and I recommend this writer to you a wonderful biologist E.O. Wilson but um, in this book he's written a letter to Thoreau and I just came across it the other day and I thought I'd just love to read you a little bit of this letter that he's gone to Walden to, to see what it was that Thoreau was trying to do there and to try and look at it in today's terms. He says, you searched for essence at Walden. Um, you hit upon an ethic with a solid feel to it. Nature is ours to explore forever. Save it, you said, in, in wilderness is the preservation of the world. I'm forced to report bad news. And he's, written, he's writing this in 2001. He says, um, in, 2000 and world, in 2001, the natural world is everywhere disappearing before our eyes, cut to pieces, mowed down, plowed under, gobbled up, replaced by human artifacts. No one in your time could imagine such a disaster. And now, six million people fill the world the great majority are very poor and exist on the edge of starvation. We're all struggling, they're all struggling to raise the quality of their lives in any way they can. And unfortunately, this includes the conversion of us, uh, the surviving remnants of the natural environment. It is the wreckage of the planet by an exuberantly plentiful and ingenious humanity and the race is now on between the techno-scientific forces that are destroying the living environment and those that can be harnessed to save it. We're inside a bottleneck of overpopulation and wasteful consumption. In order to pass through the bottleneck, a global land ethic is urgently needed. Not just any land ethic that might happen to enjoy agreeable sentiment, but one based on the best understanding of ourselves and the world around us that science and technology can provide. Surely the rest of life matters. Surely our stewardship is the only hope. For here in Walden Pond, the lamentations of the morning dove and the green frogs cronk across the water were the true reason for saving this place. But for us, it is an exact knowledge of what that truth is and all it implies and how to employ it to the best effect. Anyway, I just sort of thought, um, I'd just like to premise it uh, about really the kind of urgency I feel and how can we talk about it in art. And I think this Biennale is really interesting in that it really, most of the issues the artists are all talking about are political issues. They are the plights of humanity. But they're not in didactic way because as David talks about, that he realises that art has to create a distance in order to see it, in order for some objectivity, in order for an aesthetic to develop. So it's not just didactic statements one is making, one is making art that's different. And I think that what, uh, what's happening now in art is 
a lot of artists, a lot of art is really uh, wanting to, to, to talk about issues, to talk about political issues, and, and my particular interest is environmental issues. It's not new at all. It's never been mainstream, but I'm hope, hopeful that it's becoming more mainstream. I've just been travelling in the last year and seen some extraordinary exhibitions that are dedicated to these concerns. And I just wanted to bring it up because it's um, obviously with my work and particularly with my work in the Biennale and how it links up with other Biennale works that may not seem, you know, on the surface so apparent about the issues that they are talking about. But that is the domineering thing about this Biennale. And it's a, I think it's a great um, privilege to be in this show. I think it's... Um, it's um, it's always it's fantastic to be contextualised in such a, a, a very a great breadth of thinking about how David Elliott, the curator, has been able to think about those things and the complexity and how one issue there can affect another issue there and and the different ways artists um, um, speak about things, but how how art can have this voice. And so I, I just, you know, it is for me a very a great privilege to be in it. And when he asked me and then said, would you be in the Botanical Gardens? I thought, well, that's obviously a very um, a great thing for me, a not great opportunity for me to actually do a work in the Sydney Botanical Gardens. I, um, I, I was away in France at the time and I was spending a lot of time looking in, working actually in the Natural History Museum and looking in a lot of natural, um, a lot of other natural history museums and science museums and spending a lot of time in the Jardin du Plant and thinking a lot about, about a work. I'd had a long dreamed of passion to make a garden for sick plants. And then when I began, to, because I'd, actually over the years I've often made uh, models of dreams of projects, I have actually made some artworks. One is in Japan, it's like a little elixir bar, it's like a little botanical museum that you enter into um, it, where herbs are collected by local people and various parts of the plants are steeped in shochu that make these elixirs to drink for our health. Someone in a white coat brings you in and, and, and you get little shot glasses of the elixir, so it's part bar, part laboratory, part apothecary, part botanical, um, botanical museum. So, and then I've dreamt up other um, sort of projects I'd love to do, like a, um, a, a, a glass house for lost botanical species and various other medicinal uh, gardens for different sorts of causes, and one of them had been for sick plants. So I guess that's the first thing I thought of. This is the opportunity to do that. And then I began to think about what, how would you really realise it? How can I really make that work? Sitting in the botanical gardens, um, you know, it's fragile. It's, and then, what does it really mean to use plants, to use plants in art? What happens when you use plants? Because we can think about all the aspects of plants, and, but when you actually put plants into an artwork, they do something very different, because we're used to much more static, artificial, virtual things in art that we manipulate, materials and elements that we manipulate. But plants become a kind of collaborator with us. They work with us. They, they change in time. They change in dimension. They, they change with the weather. You know, you can't just, they're not just these static things. And the other thing is that they have effect on your senses. Very different that you don't expect. And you don't just look at the outside of a plant. You already perceive its inside, its inner being, its, its, its whole living being. And I think the thing is that I didn't realise myself the effect of um, plants in artworks, how it would affect, until I, I did make a piece that the MCA owned called Cellular Gardens. And it's a piece where little tiny plants are interconnected by tubes 
and they sort of feed one another. And it came out of a project that I'd done in South America in the jungle, where they were pulling down the whole jungle. It was as though these were the little survivors. And everyone in the museum said that it was wonderful to kind of look after them. They, they felt this nurturing thing. And um, they were sort of really busy with them, you know, so they noticed the tiniest little things on them. and they. And, it, and I, it, you sort of began to feel this empathy for these plants. And so that's one of the things I really thought about. If you could make a place that could become a metaphor for the fragility of our environment, and if in any way that's possible, to help bring attention to those things I was talking about. That's sort of you know, what I'd, I'd like to do. So I thought about, OK, I'm going to use plants, and I'm going to use well plants, and I'm going to use sick plants, and I'm going to, you know, it's, uh, how am I going to, how, what are the ways I'm going to think about it? And then I read this extraordinary essay called Plant Physics, The Silent Power of Waiting. And so I used the word waiting in the title because the incredible thing about this um, text I read was it's about, it was really about the physics of the waiting of plants and the incredible complex biochemical intelligence of plants and incredible structures and systems and, I mean, it's just so fascinating. But the fact that they're so connected to their environment that they wait, they wait till the conditions are right, till they grow, and so on, how different that is to us. And I began to think about how very opposite way that we've behaved. And yet I began to think that we're so totally dependent on plants. You know, first of all, our vascular tissues are so similar, you know, the movement of fluids for our body. But the other incredible thing is we're so dependent on them, of course, for our oxygen, for, for our sight, for carotene, for all our nutrition, both directly and indirectly. And so I just you know, began to think this incredible dependency on plants. And so, I mean, as if we didn't know that, but it was just that trying to sort of think about trying to create a space that we'd feel very intimate with them as well and feel that connection with them. So I thought that I have to bring some human kind of dimension to it. So I began to think about how I could see it as a hospital. If we thought about it like a, like a hospital, a place of healing and a place full of ailments and a place full of um, medicinal equipment that we use, but because we're all kind of got these vascular systems, it's not very different, the equipment that you would use for a plant hospital from a human hospital. I mean, obviously, some things are very different, but there are a lot of things that are very similar. And then, of course, there was the glass house and thinking about the incredible thing about a glass house in the garden and the he whole history of glass houses. And I've done a lot of work over the years with glass houses and glass houses. So it's also the architectural glass houses that reflect the environment and also the great colonial structures that uh, house these, the, all the plants, the, the, the spoils of the colonial conquest, these incredible spaces of wonder, delight, health, pleasure, and thinking about w what it was those glass houses gave. But above all, one of the things that I've been doing over the years is photographing all the empty ones. Because now, so many of those glass houses are like ghost houses. These beautiful, big, huge glass structures that you couldn't even build today. The, the incredible engineering in the building of those glass houses and the craftsmanship in the steel work, you couldn't do it now. And I think these, they fascinated me, these places, and as I've done some exhibitions about them, it's the memories they hold and the memories of those, as I said, the plant memories that they house. I would have loved to have been able to build a glass house, but how could I? I couldn't build a glass house <laughs> there. So I built a little mesh house. <laughs> and, but what I did was, in thinking about those glass houses, the site I chose is the site of the Crystal Palace in Sydney, the Palace Gardens. 
So it's sort of like a crystal memory of it. And I've been really interested in glass and your use of glass. And I'm not a glass artist, so I often work with glass artists. But it, and I'm just fascinated by the properties of it, the mineral lineage in it, but also what glass does with light, the reflections, the projections, the concavity, convexity of surfaces, the whole, the degrees of translucency, transparency, um, opacity, the whole transformations that you can have with light and glass, but also the whole history of visibility through glass, through the invention of glass, we, be it lens instruments, be it windows bringing in light, be it all this, all sort of instruments in glass, glass has been instrumental to creating visibility. I just sort of wanted to have this crystalline feeling, the laboratory glass, the glass and the medicinal glass, and to bring this all into some sort of synthesis with the plants. And then the other thing I thought about, in this, this is in just conceiving the work, I thought a lot about vitrines, the showcase of wonders, the cabinet of curiosities, the whole thing about collecting these things and creating a kind of surprise with them, creating a kind of a sense of wonder. But of course, wonder's very hard to, <laughs> to get because wonder's really about something that doesn't have a kind of logic. It's, you, you don't really know the meaning of it, so you kind of wonder. But if you can create that sense of wonder, I, I think it's arts often trying to pursue that. So I think I was sort of thinking about that. And I was thinking a lot about vitrines and, the, and, and all the different sort of the, uh, different vitrines. And one of the great ones that I absolutely love is the Joseph Boyce vitrines and their alchemicals uh, and material transformations. And he's been a great figure to me. Anyway, just back to, I built a little mesh house, and I don't know whether any of you have seen it, but up in the palace gardens. So it has the structure of both a hospital and the physiology of a plant. And as a hospital, it has uh, like little wards. It has the um, fertilization ward. It has the intensive care ward with little plants on drips. The, the heart ward. It's got a morgue where there's just the sort of the uh, just the skeleton of ash of some plants fused into glass. And then it has this sort of green wellness ward. And that corresponds with the different areas of the physiology of the plant. The plant, it's like the chlorophyll production end, the green end. And then there's sort of the carbon production area. Uh, and then there's the, there are all these different sort of parts of the plant. And then there's a the sort of dead Cambrian area. And so, um, so this sort of structure gave me a sort of great fun and joy to to put this whole thing together and to think about how you can move it around it. It has a casualty ward, and it has all these sort of bandaged plants in quite transparent gauze bandages. And this is completely necessary for, t for a couple of reasons. One, because I, like, I wanted to create these forms of the plants, the ends of the plants, but also uh, to prevent the fungal and spore spillage, as it were, from the plants out into the gardens. All the, I had to work with plant pathology, which was a great thing, opportunity to work. I also have a lot of images that I got from plant pathology working there, and um, from the, you know even all sorts of you know photography of the cells of plants and things, and a few of them there, and X-rays, and um, this wrapping of plants became really necessary even more than I expected because a lot of the plants couldn't go out into the, out into the gardens unless they were, they were wrapped to protect them from spore, spore spillage. And the, the, the whole space has to be sprayed. It's very, very controlled. And in actual fact, um, it's, it's um, very, the, the strictness, all plants go through quarantine when they're in here. I don't know why they don't worry about our picnic lunches. But, um, and you know, every little leaf examined, it's quite extraordinary actually. And I worked also with the gardeners of the gardens to get a lot of the water plants. The smallest plant in the world is there called a waffa. 
And basically, it was a marvellous uh, opportunity to collaborate with the gardens. And another thing I've always loved doing is working with scientists, because the scientists have all that fantastic knowledge. And one way as an artist that you can think about is making visible a lot of that, because you know they're working away with all this extraordinary uh, knowledge and imagery and things like that, and thinking about how art can bring that into visibility. The making of the work was I had the most fantastic support from the glass students, from volunteers, from um, the Ainsworth family and their um, garden, the Eden Gardens, and their horticulturalist. It's been a very quite a massive sort of undertaking. To, <laughs> to bring all this about. And the volunteers every day have to keep up the maintenance of the whole thing, and plants need watering. There's a little. So basically, what it looks like when you see it is sorry, I forgot to tell you, is it looks like a little kind of um, glassy laboratory sort of space in the gardens. I wanted it to be the most luminous, white, translucent space both inside, to feel the experience that you were inside and outside in the gardens. So it was like a little laboratory. They're sitting in the gardens quite weirdly, you know, quite surreally in some way, but that you could look in and see it and it becomes this kind of screen. And the, and the laboratory glass and the elements in it, they often shadow onto the screen walls of the mesh. So they form these kind of strange screens at different times of day. And there's little uh, solar pumps that keep the water churning. And the fact that all the rain tried to wash down half the gardens into it, it was uh, a little deterrent to my wanting this clean, white, white sort of space. That's really what you, you, you look into it and you see. And then you start reading the individual elements. And you sort of see how the plants on intravenous uh, f uh, tubes connect with other plants and how all the little plants can be fed from outside and you sort of look in and you sort of see that up towards one end as I said it's like the, it's the chlorophyll production and they're the well plants down there and there's a few um, herbal plants down there medicinal herbal plants as there are planted on the outside and basically, though, it's also a little place that what I really want you to feel is a kind of empathy for the plants, as I was saying, is to bring their psychological being as though they were the patients. There's little tiny pink beds with plants on them, like a, a, a kind of ward of little plants sleeping. And there's, I mean, a lot of different elements. There's some precious stones in there as the alchemical transformers. There's lots of minerals and salts that the plants might need. And of course, all the fluids running through. It's, it's also just a place for a bit of kind of fantasy, I suppose, or wonder perhaps, or just place where the glass starts to just work with itself with the different reflections and elements. And, and really, for me, I'd, I'd feel really happy to think that it spoke in some way about the fragility of the environment, that it was able to, to um, bring attention to that because the fact that you're closed in this little white space and you, that, that you can feel that intimacy and the, and the tender attention our environment needs. So I think with that, I'll, yeah, I hope you can see it if you haven't seen it up in the Palace Gardens, just near the Macquarie Gate.